Welcome back to the Behind the Well Show. Roger Abel here with Jonas Everett. Jonas, welcome back to the show. It's It's been a while since we did this together. I think the, the last show we had you on was actually with Elias. How you doing, Roger? It's uh, I know I uh, I'm, I hang out with you guys on the radio, but this podcast is uh, started starting to be just as popular. I think so. It's pretty popular. Yeah. It's kind of fun. We let Molly edit out, out all the the mistakes we make as we did at the intro of the show. <laughs> well, I, this whole thing's going to be edited today. I have a feeling. So. Yeah, mo- most of the people aren't going to know this, but I called Jonas Elias four times to start the show so uh, with that said let's just kick it off and you know I met with somebody yesterday Jonas and you've you've been in the business almost 30 years and I think this is a pretty common question that people really like to ask us and they say what should you do with your tax refund and and I had this exact question yesterday Um, how do you approach that with with people Jonas when they say what should I do with my tax refund well you have to think about a financial strategy I think thinking about uh, a strategy for your tax refund is a good strategy. And what I mean by that, everybody's different, but you know, I've seen people split it up to where they take half of it and put it in savings. Uh, they put it away and they take the other half and maybe pay a bill off. Um, a lot of people use it for a vacation. That's their vacation money. Um, I, I just think that any financial strategy for your tax refund is, is a good one. Just whatever you do, don't get it and stick it, uh, stick it in savings, or don't get it and blow it. Have a financial strategy. You know, it's interesting. I so when someone tells me they're getting a tax refund, the first thing I ask them is why. Why are you getting money back? And and I had a situation with an individual I met with two days ago. She's getting ten thousand a year back. I go, why did you get a ten thousand dollar federal tax refund? Like, did you have a big deduction? No. I just withhold the money because it's almost like they're for savings. And I said, well, that's great. And that probably didn't matter that much when interest rates were zero, when you got nothing at the bank. But I said, now you're getting good yields at the bank. You can get three to 4% on a CD or cash or whatever the investment vehicle may be that's safe. Why would you want to give the government a $10,000 loan for a year? I said, you're waiting to get the money back. And she never really thought about it. So for some people, I think if you're getting a big tax refund back, you need to start asking yourself why. And is that actually really beneficial to you? And you could just set up a systematic savings plan that gets invested day one, compounds day one, going to have a better long-term return than leaving with the IRS. I don't know. I'm. Do you run into that a lot where you have people that are, you know, trying to save up extra money just so they get this federal tax refund? I do, and I think you you hit the nail on the head, Roger. It's just a forced savings. It's just a, something that they look for, forward to, and they forget about their withholdings. You know, people forget. That's the whole thing. That's why people use financial advisors, right, because humans forget all the time, especially about financial stuff. And uh, they may have set up their withholdings a long time ago, but but like you said, things are different. Interest rates are, are different now. We, ha- we actually have uh, – CDs back on the radar that haven't been around for 15 years now that uh, uh, people are able to get uh, upwards of 5%. So it's a a good time to make an adjustment uh, with your tax withholdings and really have some type of a financial strategy on that tax refund. I know for, for one thing, the people I'm talking to, the prices of things have gone up exponentially um, just on the basic items that people buy, like dog food, bags of dog food. Um, I know in the Everett family, we have two border collies, and both of the da- dogs, a ba- bags of dog food have gone up $15 a bag. And, uh, you know, the the tax refunds are going uh, to the inflated items to the groceries uh, more than ever before this day and age. Well, some things have gone up, but some things have gone down, like apparently the size of the cookie at Granite City. Mm-hmm. Shrinkflation, right? Well, I mean, that's so. the silent inflation nobody talks about. Right. It's the size, you know, the cereal box went from 13.8 ounces to 11.7. Or, you know, like you used to always get a dozen chicken wings, then it went to a pound, and now it's you buy them five at a time. But the five are still ten bucks, right? So you got to buy two. Yeah. So you got to. So now you got to buy ten. So now it's twenty bucks for what you used to pay twelve right. for. So you're right. Inflation 
you know, is creeping into everybody's everyday life. But one of the things I, I think about right now is I read um, an article the other day that, you know, credit card debt is getting to almost an all time high. And if you're getting a tax refund and you have any credit card debt whatsoever, I think you should be looking to pay that off. Credit card rates are some of them are over 20% now. You know, when it was 12% on a credit card, maybe you thought twice about paying it off. You shouldn't have, but most people did. At 20 or 22%, you better hammer that out before you save any money. You got to get that off the books because it's just going to be a negative drag on your on your financial future um, to not pay that off. Oh, I know. And the access to credit is, is so available, still available. My, my drugstore... I qualified for a 28% uh, credit card, retail credit card for the drugstore. And I went back and looked at all my investments and none of my investments were, were making 28%. So you're exactly right. I mean, that that's a big number that you have to pay off. Um, even having a little bit of balance with a number on 20%, if you, if you make the minimum payments, you've seen the back of the, the credit card statements, Roger takes 15 or 20 years just to pay off a $2,000 uh, balance if you're making the minimum payments. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people think that the rewards program, those are free goodies. No, no, you paid for those more times than whatever you're receiving back in points or airline miles or free hotel stays. They got you. And I talked with this last night uh, on the radio show with Doug about this. And he mentioned doing a balance transfer. I'm like, that's a bad idea. Well, and he goes, why? It's 0%. I said, well, you're paying 5% to get a 0% interest rate. So the interest rate was really five right away, day one. I said, but number two, everybody's just going to make the minimum payment. They're not going to make the payment it takes to pay it off during the 0% time. And then the 22% clicks in. So you paid 5% plus 22 and you just never got out of the bad behavior racking this credit card debt up. Right, right. You'd hit the nail on the head. It's a behavior. And if you're rolling your balance over instead of concentrating on paying it down, then that, that's just the lateral behavior. That's not going to get you any uh, in, in any better situation. And really, before the early 80s, believe it or not, Roger, you could, uh, you could deduct your credit card interest. You could deduct your car payment. Really? You could, could, you could deduct... Any interest that you had before the Reagan Tax Reform Act, um, and now I know that we're going to talk about mortgages a little bit. The mortgage interest is really the last tax deduction that people, most people, have in their households. And that, well, that's actually been shrunk too because it used to be a loan, loans up to a million dollars you could tax deduct the interest. Now it's capped at seven fifty. But you think about it, so they brought that down when housing prices are going up. I remember in our area, you know, a five hundred thousand dollar house is a really nice house. It's a good house now. I wouldn't say it. I mean, it's nice, but it's not like right. It's what three hundred thousand was three years ago. Um, the, the the next thing we're going to talk about, I think this is a good one. I'm throwing you a layup here, Jonas, since you had a a child celebrate a fifteen year old birthday last night, and you know we have talks with parents and grandparents about this. But what what do you think is the right age that your kids should be financially independent? I know when I grew up, after 18, my parents were there to support me from a place to live and those things. But I had a job when I was 18 years old. And I was, for all intents and purposes, financially independent. Um, never got any money from my parents after I turned 18. You know, they helped with my college and stuff like that. But there was never like, hey, I need to live with you guys when I'm 25. And I know you have kids approaching this. And there's studies out there that say young adults believe that 21 is a good starting age to start paying for some of their own expenses. What do you what do you think? What are you telling your kids when you tell them it's time to spread your wings and do this on your well, own? What about now? <laughs> <laughs> what about right now? Uh no, I, I think every family's different, but uh, you, I think you're exactly right, Roger. You start with the work ethic, the uh, the job. Um, if you look at uh, financial independence, that's going to be a different age for everybody. I have one customer that uh, he talked about, you know, having when he was 12, he had a paper route, and he had to go and collect the dues that people owed him, and he had to put his own money 
up front, you know, in the bank. And if somebody wasn't home when he went to uh, to get the dues for their papers, that came out of his pocket. So he was basically uh, learning a lot about finances at, at, at age 12. But uh, I think somewhere around the 18 to 21 uh, year old range is a, is a good range. Now, um, there's a difference between handouts and I think investments to kids. Um, if kids are, are planning maybe starting their own business or maybe they're, uh, we talk about the, uh, the college again, the, uh, the cost of college, um, maybe uh, every family can work out a deal with their kids if they think it's a good investment, like maybe pay for half of college or maybe pay for something if the kid is getting good grades. I think that's up to each individual family, but uh, there's a difference between a handout and an investment with your child, I think. You know, whenever whenever I get this question, the first thing that comes to mind is stepbrothers. Yeah. I really hope my kids aren't there at 40 years old, <laughs> like duking it out and playing Star Wars, whatever they do in that show. Just like, that's what I think about. But, you know, part of that's parenting and making him get out of the house. And I think that's a good point. It took, in Step Brothers movie, it took them till those boys were 40 to say, hey, get out on your own. And when they had to do it in the beginning, it was pretty tough. I remember uh, Will Ferrell, forget his name, but he ran out of toilet paper. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? Pretty soon he got a budget and he started doing all like the adulting type stuff that he right, probably right. should have done. But some of that can be taught by a parent when these kids are 15, 16, 17 years old. Like these are the responsibilities you have to have. I know I we did a podcast a couple weeks ago and it was about how a third grade teacher makes her her uh, her students rent their desk and chairs and they can earn money by doing assignments on time. And it's all like monopoly money. Right. But they can earn money by doing assignments on time. And with that money, they can go buy extra recess or extra different things. But she also increased the cost to reflect inflation in their seat rent and all this stuff throughout the year. So she's teaching these young kids kind of how money works, how inflation works. And I went home that night and I told my wife, I said, you know, when our kids want something, we just buy it. Like we go to Target, you know, they're just turned seven and four. So it's kind of hard to have those conversations. But I'm like, you know, instead of having like the chore list to get a sticker, why don't we have the chore list to start earning some money that we can, you know, your kids are probably the same. My kids love the iPad, but we limit it to an hour a day. Well, I can let them buy more, you know, more pad time or my seven-year-old loves Roblox. Well, she always wants to buy stuff. I'm like, not with my money. So for her birthday, she had $7. She had $7 because she turned seven. So she goes, well, dad, I'll spend my birthday money. I'm like, okay, your money, you do what you want with it. But then maybe that's a good way to start teaching some of these adulting, you know, precursors when these kids are five, six, seven, eight, nine, when they're actually really, really impressionable. It's hard to be impressionable on a 16 year old. Like they're not, I mean, you have them. They probably don't listen to you. They, you, they don't listen. to Dad doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> well, your kids, you know, this is this is time for the uh, summer's coming up. It's time for the drink of the summer, lemonade. You know, get the, the lemonade stand is a good staple yeah, of uh, see of uh, what a uh, maybe a financial transaction uh, for that age. Maybe the first in America. Maybe that's the first financial transaction that uh, that a lot of uh, kids have. You know, that's just more effort than I want to do. And I know we're going to go broke. I told my kid, I'm like, we're going to spend more money on the lemonade than you're going to make selling that, it. That's right. They're that's going to right. drink all the profits. I know it's going to happen. But so I actually have a funny story about that. And I thought this is quite ingenious. So when my wife and I were first married, we moved into a new neighborhood. And the neighbor girl and her brother, and, and she was probably like, I don't know, six, seven, eight, somewhere in that that time frame. She had an older brother who was like 10 and then a younger brother who's maybe like four. And they come knocking on the door and they said, hey, we're doing a fundraiser. Do you want to buy some candy bars? And, you know, yeah, sure. Here's 10 bucks for the candy bars. About six hours later, I get a knock at my door with my money and it's her parents and the kids. And they're like, well, you know, they decided to do a fundraiser, but it really wasn't a fundraiser. They were just selling our candy bars. <laughs> but I thought it was ingenious. Like, they'd had enough people knock on their door that they kind of knew they could go sell candy bars for, like, inflated amounts of money. Right, right. 
But I'm like, you know, I, I said, I'm not, I don't really need the money back. I think it's like a pretty good business plan. Maybe it's not quite that ethical, but. <laughs> They're was, raising funds for themselves, right? So I, I was laughing. And it, the same neighbor could came over and said, hey, uh, can I mow your yard? And I go, well, how much are you going to charge? Because, you know, I'm trying to teach a money lesson right here. He goes, I don't know. How much will you pay? I go, that, that's not how this works. I said, you have to tell me what you're going to charge. He goes, $100. I said, nope, you can't. <laughs> no, wait, wait. No. He started with the bigger number first. So, but that's uh, good. You know, like yeah. He must have been well-trained. He's like, <laughs> but I think those are good. Like Those kids had actually recognized that there is a transaction to be made. They're thinking about money. And um, you know, I know their mom owns a business. And their dad's a profession, professional business person. But I just thought that was a unique story as we talk about like, kids and money. There's a couple things though. Sometimes when you offer assistance to your kids, that can actually backfire because they, they start to look at you as like a crutch. Like, oh, well, I got in financial trouble, so mom and dad are going to bail me out. I just spoke to the client about a week ago and they're going through this and they're like, well, the money's kind of done. They told their kids, you know, they're like 28. They're like, dad's not bailing you out anymore. It's time to figure this out and they're living in Colorado. So they're living this expensive life because they want to be in Colorado. And dad's like, well, may maybe you have to move or do something different. Like the, the bailouts are almost over, but they've been doing this till their kid's 28 years old. It's going to be hard to break that, that habit for a 28 year old. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I have a customer. This is something that, uh, I have a customer dealing with, uh, this same thing. And, uh, you know, at some, at some point you have to draw the line and just uh, um, cut off the, uh, the, the finances. Um, yeah, I know it's difficult. I, I mean, every family's different. But, uh, um, yeah, at some point uh, maybe you got to move back and uh, adjust your lifestyle a little bit. And uh, maybe, maybe you just got to work as hard as your parents did. You know, as we talk about how we kind of build our kids up and get them to understand money, we can also do things to help our kids. If, if you want to, from a monetary standpoint, you know, help your kids and you want to build generational wealth, there's some like key accounts people can establish to do this. And in the last three years, I've opened more custodial Roth IRAs than, than I ever remember. And, you know, most people don't even know what a custodial Roth IRA is. And it's really, it's a Roth IRA for your kids. So if your kids have earned income, they're eligible to do a Roth IRA, even though they might be a minor. Um, I have one client where they own a business and their kids clean all summer and they pay them to clean. They file a tax return, which they makes them eligible to make a Roth contribution. And they asked if they were doing the right thing. And I said, well, I sure wish my parents would have been able and been in a position to do that because can you imagine Jonas having an eight year old who gets a Roth IRA and gets two or three thousand dollars a year put in there from the time they're eight till they're sixty, what it's gonna be worth? It's just mind blowing. It's millions of dollars. It's a million if you put here's what I know, there's a mutual fund we use. Over the last thirty five years, if you would have put three hundred dollars a month away. For 35 years, it turned into $1.2 million. Now you're talking about 52 years, let's say, eight to, it's going to be millions of dollars. And it's not, for a lot of parents, it's not that much money. And if they have it, what a great way to start building a work ethic, learning about money, and start to build generational wealth that way. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just the fact that you're learning about uh, money too, you're getting the statements in the mail, you're able to show your kids maybe the statements and uh, if they're able to take, uh, you know, that that job, those wages and actually turn that into a uh, investment for their future. But uh, yeah, the compound interest on that is just going to be staggering for people that uh, that start it. Uh, you, you give something, you know, you talked about 35 years, but yeah, look at 40 and, and 50 years and and look at look at the financially successful people that we talked to, Roger. They did very little research when the 401k came available to them, right? In the early 90s, maybe the late 80s. Somebody told them just to put 10% in, that's all they did. They, did. they didn't understand what a 401k was. They didn't really necessarily know what the investments were on the inside. But they just maxed it out or they put 10 or 15% in. 
Well, that was night. That was the late '80s or 1990. Look at 30 years later. All you know, these people that started the 401ks right away, they have upwards of a million dollars saved up in their 401ks, and all they did was just get started. It's just absolutely amazing. I talked to a 25 year old today, and he called and wanted to know about a Roth IRA. I said, "Well, do you want to get started today?" He goes, "Yeah, I do." Like that. It's that simple. Just do you want to get started? It's funny you say that about they didn't have any information. I was reading an article here recently talking about how as people get more information and become more educated about investments, many times it actually makes them worse than worse investors because it's kind of that level of confidence. Um, we talked about this a lot during COVID, but as soon as somebody learns something about something, they have this overconfidence level where they believe they know everything about it. And it actually can be detrimental to their investing results. Sometimes not knowing much is better. You don't feel like you're gonna outsmart the system. Once people start knowing a little, they're like, well, maybe I should buy that or sell that. And they try to get cute with this. That's not really how it works. It really works by buying really good investments and holding them for a long period of time and letting that work out. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I think that uh, you can get uh, analysis paralysis too. You can you can shop around. There's so many different investments now that if you get hung up on which one um, you're going to do, uh, individual stocks or mutual funds or Roth IRAs or traditional IRAs. You know, I think that that's that's why we have a job. I think that's why people out, seek out financial advice to try to get um, that one good uh, recommendation for their household. And I think that, uh, yeah, starting with young people, I had a 17 year old. Um, she uh, she put a thousand dollars in a Roth IRA, and I thought that that was. Uh, and she's 25 now and married, and uh, she brought her husband in, and uh, I just. I couldn't get over that. I thought that was fantastic that she put her her own money at 17 in a Roth IRA. And I just really congratulated her because uh, she picked up, she did the investment, but she has that, that term. She has the lingo down now. She has some of the financial terms down that she's going to run into all her life. Uh, but now she's it, it just started compounding for her. Now she's doing a lot in her 401k. They're talking about having kids. She wants to do college savings plans. She's almost as smart as I am now about this financial stuff, Roger, and it's all about getting started. Well, and getting started is step one, and you get started at this young age, and you do a great job accumulating, but then you have to transition to this kind of retirement phase and that's where there's a whole other set of pitfalls that can threaten that once you hit retirement that people haven't even thought about. I, I had a conversation with someone on the phone the other day, and we were talking about, you know, we put together a financial plan. They're two years from retirement. And they thought this was just about investing money. And we started talking about all the different pieces, you know, some tax strategies, distribution strategies, how we allocate funds, all these different things, when to take Social Security and the pensions. And about halfway through the meeting, they they looked at each other and said, you know what, this is way more complicated than we thought it was. We need your help with this. And we never even talked about investment. So the other thing I thought we'd do today is cover what we call the seven threats to your actual financial freedom in retirement. Because there's really seven key things that could happen in retirement that could really derail it. And I think the first thing that really can derail any any retirement in, you know, a lot of this is no fault of somebody's, but if you have an unhealthy retirement, if you think about what happens in retirement, healthcare becomes a very, very, very big issue when somebody retires. Have you experienced any clients who you've seen just start running through money in retirement due to health care, Jonas? You've done this for 30 years. I'm sure you've seen it at some point. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm seeing uh, people still working in their 60s to get the knee replacements, try to get the things uh, fixed on their body before they're age 65, before they retire. But, uh, yeah, this is a big, uh, big threat. And, uh um, for a lot of people in their 80s, that's the last rock rolling at them. Uh, the home care, the cost of a home care nurse, or, or just the this, just the cost of uh, aging, 
Um, but, you know, I think that uh, uh, we look at, uh, you know, we look at the importance of having that rainy day fund and uh, you are, uh, money is going to be a useful tool no matter what age you are. And it could be early on in retirement or it could be in your 80s, but money's going to be very useful. You have to have that working for you in retirement just as well as it working for you while you're still working. Well, the retire Fidelity Retiree Health Care Cost Estimate is that you're going to need approximately $315,000 saved for health care-related expenses. It, most people, that's a staggering number. $315,000, that's more than most people have saved for health care. Well, you look at just the Medicare Part B premiums and you look at the cost of prescription drugs over a 25-year retirement, that 315000 the math kind of almost pencils out there. Um, I'm surprised that's not higher if you throw in any inflation at all with that number. Well, think about this too. That doesn't count the vision and dental that's not covered by Medicare. And dental can be huge. I just got a call from an individual the other day. They need $11,000 for dental work. Mm -hmm. That's a huge expense for a retiree. So there, that's kind of the number one thing that I think most people don't plan for in retirement, but really can derail it if, if they don't have a way to plan for it. The, one of the other big risks, and I know from the time that I've started doing financial plans for people is really longevity risk and planning for the day none of us want to think about. But when you started and you did a financial plan, I'm pretty sure you're doing financial profiles, if I remember. That's what I started on. And you did planning. What age were you using as life expectancy? So the date of death when you started doing this, you know, 25 plus years ago. I think it was age 80. That's what I used was age 80. <laughs> so you think about that, that. That seems that seems unbelievable now. 80. And now in our planning software, we've, we've got it out to 92 and 94. And, you know, my fear is in 20 years, we're going to be at 102. And people aren't planning for 102. They're, they're matching their lifestyle to 92. And, and I have cases where Clients actually tell me, well, I'll never live that long, so let's use 86. And the reason they want to use 86 is they want the answer they want to hear, not the answer they need to hear, which is, hey, maybe you won't be successful if you live till 92, which granted, if you run out of money at 86, I mean, you know, hopefully you still know. Some people won't know they ran out. But I think that's a huge risk that people underestimate when they start to think about their overall longevity. I can go pull up a list of clients in this office over 80. It's more than you'd think. Well, I, I talk to my boomers all the time that are in their uh, 60s and maybe retired for a couple of years. And, you know, I ask them, what, you know, what's your big financial goal? Are you, are you going to buy a vineyard or are you going to buy a sailboat and sail across the world? And they're like... Uh, no, I'm going to go have lunch with my mom. She's 92. I got to take her to the doctor. And uh, we might be able to squeeze out one one week vacation. Uh, but they want to be around their parents because their parents are still alive. And they're uh, they're responsible and they, they like helping out their, their parents. But uh, yeah, I had one customer, mom's 92 and still lives at home and uh, doesn't have the driver's license anymore and needs you know, needs a, a ride back and forth to doctor's appointments. But this is just, uh, it's mind blowing how, how much longer people are living. And I think that that's a, that's a function of the Midwest too. And we just have fantastic healthcare around here. This is, uh, I have a lot of, um, a lot of customers that, uh, uh, winter down in, uh, Texas and, uh, Arizona and California and, and, uh, usually, uh, uh, Florida, Texas and Arizona, well, they come back here for the better part of the year just for the health care. The health care is a lot better. Another risk people run is not saving enough for retirement. And I think this is where, you know, our industry has done a pretty good job of encouraging people to save. But I think it's to figure out how much you need to save isn't just a blanket number. That's just kind of the easy way out. Some people might need to save 10%. Some might be 25 I know you do the same thing as I do, and we like to run through a financial plan for people who are in their 35, 40 years, who are 35 years old, 40 years old, because we can go in there and say, hey, Mr. Klein, if your goal is to retire at 60 and you want to spend $8,000 a month, you need to be saving $2,200 a month today, whatever those numbers are. So instead of just going with a set percentage why wouldn't somebody go through the process of doing a financial plan and figure out exactly what they should be saving to put them on the right track? 
I, I know you've done this with individuals and I'm sure that, you know, when you do this, it's going to lead to a better outcome. It's not the wishing and hoping and praying that it works out. It was some level of certainty. This is what we need to do. Yeah, this is uh, this is what I call just a stay retired income number. And it, a lot of it is just having somebody see if the math pencils out for your uh, lifestyle in, in retirement and uh, what your relationship is uh, with money. We just add up all the sources of income and uh, why people can't do that themselves, Roger, is uh, we factor in the prices of things going up. I mean, it's really impossible. The I guess the, the, the regular person that has done a good job saving money but isn't in the financial industry kind of forgets about inflation. But I just call it a stay retired income number. That's a individual number for each household where you can go to sleep at night knowing that you have enough money coming in to the mailbox or the bank account each month where you don't have to go to work the next day. That leads into the next next one I want to talk about, which is the risk of spending too much in retirement. And we see this a lot. People believe that, you know, if I'm spending it before I retire, that's what I'm going to spend when I retire. And realistically, you're probably going to spend more in the first three to five or seven years. And the other thing that happens is people are used to living off of their monthly paycheck and that's all they have because they've seen this big pot of money as untouchable. It's almost like as soon as they crack into the pot of money, they think it's all accessible. They don't look at the paycheck anymore. So all of a sudden you get the call that, hey, I'm buying an RV. I need 125,000 or I'm doing like, I'm getting solar panels. It's $65,000 purchases they never would have made before. But now they have this big pot of money and they feel like it's okay to do it. And what they're doing is they're putting their retirement at risk by overspending. I think when people do a financial plan, we talk about this a lot. What are, what do you plan on doing the first five years? It goes back to the non-financial plan. If you plan on traveling and you're spending 60,000 a year now, we better make it like 75 or 80 for the first five years of retirement because you're going to have a lot more time to travel. How many times do you deal with this? Have you ran into situations where people just massively overspend? You know, I don't, I don't typically see people underspending. It's usually an overspend scenario in retirement. Well, it is. And uh, you almost have to uh, um, just um, convince them to just take only the interest and uh, dividends um, off of their retirement accounts and, and their investments and uh, try to leave the principal alone, at least initially uh, in retirement. Kind of like the story of the goose and the golden egg. Uh, that's You were just describing people that uh, look at their golden goose and kind of sneak up and they start hacking off uh, lump sums off of the goose. Well, it's going to make your golden eggs a lot less uh, and you're going to run the, the risk of uh, running out of money. And especially now with the, uh, the different, um, there's not as many guaranteed sources of, uh, of income in retirement. You have Social Security, but uh, um, we used to deal with couples, Roger, that they, they may have they may have had three different pensions in the household and they're retiring three pensions, two social securities. We're not seeing that anymore. We're seeing maybe one pension at most and then two social securities. Um, the next generation, all you're going to see is two social S securities, uh, guaranteed payments, and then their money. <laughs> well, if you think about that, that's scary because some of these pensions we're seeing are three, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 a month. Well, I always like to play this game with somebody, if, if you were going to get $50,000 a year from a pension, equate that to how much you'd have to have saved. How much would someone have to save to get 50000 a year? At least a hundred, at least a million dollars. Yep. So, so think about this client. They've got six, because you see this client all the time, because I know what your clientele is. They got six hundred to 800000 saved in a 401k, and they have a $4,000 a month pension. Well, that $4,000 a month pension is worth a million bucks, let's call it. And they got another 600, that's 1.6 million. Not that many people are hitting 1.6 million in their 401k. They might get to six or eight. They're going to miss this other piece of the puzzle. Yep. So people actually need to be more diligently saving these 401ks and in retirement vehicles than they probably ever have in the past because nobody is going to be there to bail you out. You are dependent upon your own money. You remember back when Jeff did the workshops at the, uh, at the, the library downtown oh, yeah. yep. and put the, 
and this is on a projector, not even like PowerPoint, an actual projector, which we just got rid of that projector here like a week ago. He'd put up that stool picture and like it's the income stool, three legs, pensions, social security, your own money. We're just kicking out one of those yep. legs. And yep. most people are not going to be able to balance on two legs of the stool. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so much more pressure. And really, the, the next one, uh, you know, that uh, is back on the radar that scares me the most is uh, just what we talked about, the prices of things that uh, we have to project now on our financial plans, 6.3% inflation. Um, that's because that's what the number is today. And uh, uh, this is really affecting the, uh, the pocketbook, I think, for people uh, right now. Um, the groceries, the uh, um, just the, the the savings being shriveled up, or and I, I call it, uh, um, you know, I just call it a, an invisible risk that uh, once these years go by where there is inflation, um, that uh, it's going to put more and more pressure on the pocketbook. But yeah, we, we're having to run six point three percent in our financial plans right now, Roger, and that. That hasn't been here. That hasn't been around for a long, long time. It's, it's usually been about two or three percent inflation that we have to run. That's a really good point, and we're all seeing it's not just retirees, but they, they get double whammy because they get the healthcare inflation, which is usually higher than regular inflation, and then they're on a fixed income with a Social Security check. Well, fortunately, that went up, but maybe not to offset the cost of eggs and just the normal everyday type of stuff. Um, lack of stock market risk is another one that people, I see this all the time. They see retirement as the day in which them being invested in the stock market should be over. And when they say, hey, I need to be more conservative when I retire, my first question is, well, how long are you going to be retired for? Someone says my time horizon's two years. Well, are you dying in two years? Is there something I don't know? Because arguably, there's a lot of people that are going to spend more time in retirement than they actually worked. Think of a 60 year old, if they lived till 95, they could have spent more time in retirement than working. And this is where having an actual financial plan is critical to, to dial in and figure out what the optimal portfolio is for that individual to give them the best outcome in retirement. Sometimes it is a very conservative portfolio. Sometimes people have to take more risk than they really thought they would need to take when they're that age and it's because of the lifestyle they want to live and the income and interest that needs to be generated on these investments. Well, you know, and we're, I, I think it's just the, the term stock market that's, that scares people because most people are already invested in the stock market, but then you talk about the stock market and that's immediately scary to them. People need to understand that we're talking about haystacks and not needles. We're talking about not trying to pick um, one or two winners, but just uh, having a haystack of uh, diversified uh, investments. And uh, this is going on a lot um, now. I, I have uh, friends in their early 50s. They're like, uh, well, 401ks aren't working anymore. I should just go out and buy CDs, right? And uh, um, I, I ask him exactly what you did, Roger. I said, well, let me ask you this. When is money going to be no longer useful to you? And they kind of chuckle a little bit, right? Well, it's always going to be useful. Well, if you put your money in CDs, you're losing to inflation now in your 50s, and then you're actually going backwards uh, on your money. And they're kind of like, they're they're starting to understand that a little bit better. Oh, I get it. So if the market goes down, I need to buy in. And, and then I usually ask them, well, what's easier to do? Um, sell high or buy low? Because I think any, everybody's different uh, there. I personally... Um, I think it's easier for me to buy low, but I purposely make myself sell high uh, too. Selling high is a lot more work for for me individually as an investor uh, than it is buying low. I think buying low, you could just systematically uh, uh, do that uh, very easily. But uh, money's going to be useful to you, but your money has to average more right now than that 6.3%, and that's what the inflation rate is right now. People fail to recognize that they hear these CD rates in the mid 4% for a 12 month CD. And they're like, well, th this is great. Well, it, the CD rates never going to be higher than inflation. I think people need to understand what a CD really is meant for. It's a short term 
cash alternative funding vehicle. It's not meant for the long term. It, it's like, hey, I'm going to buy a house in three years, so I don't want any risk on this money. That's what it's for. Or when we put together a distribution strategy for somebody and we put a one or two years worth of money in cash, that's what it's for. You build a small CD ladder in there and let that money come due and make, get the most you can out of your money. But if this is truly money you're going to have for 10 plus years, you're right. The CD, you're going backwards regardless of how high the, the only way, Jonas, someone's going to win on that CD. And I, and I had this talk with somebody the other day, because right now everybody's buying short-term CDs. You know, because the rate on a 12 month CD is higher than a five year CD. And they said, why would you ever buy a five year CD? I'm like, well, the only reason you buy a five year CD is you believe interest rates are going to go back down in the future. And if they do, you may want to have a five year funding vehicle in the mid 4%. That's guaranteed and FDIC insured. And they hadn't thought about that. They're just looking for the best rate, which if you're only going to have there for 12 months, we take the 12 month, get the best rate. But you could potentially hedge dropping interest rates in the future by buying a longer term CD. You also run the risk that interest rates do what? Go up higher. Right. So anybody who says there's no risk to a CD, there is one inherent risk. It's interest rate risk because we don't know where they're headed. Right. We all believe that interest rates will probably come down. Interest rates were over 12% for 14 straight years, over 10%. In fact, I was watching a Dave Ramsey clip two days ago, and he was talking about how he went on the radio in 1991, and he made the public announcement that we'll never see interest rates under 10%. And he said, that's the last time I ever predicted. It's the last time I ever tried to be a financial <laughs> weatherman. None of us are ever right. And he's right. None of us really know where this is going. So that's why when we work with people, we want to set up a really good financial plan and make statistical-based decisions versus guessing or predicting just we're out of the predicting business but with that said if anybody's looking for help with their financial plan wants any more information you can go to btwellshow.com jonas it was great having you on the show today do you thank have any you. anything you want to leave the listeners with uh just keep up the good work hey thanks for being here jonas want to thank everybody for listening hope you tune in next time